with me. Happy the home when God is there. And what's the subtitle? We do what? We live what we learn. So we continue our great hymns of the church series looking at this hymn, Happy the Home When God is There, which was written by an ordained Unitarian minister that pastored the second Unitarian church in Boston, Massachusetts by the name of Aaron Ware Jr. Now, Aaron's assistant was none other than the famous American poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So it is the Wares and Emerson that sort of set the course for Harvard Divinity School. Do I need to say anything more? In fact, this took me on a rather lengthy study on Unitarianism which I will not bore you with this morning because I have two pages of notes on it and if I went to those two notes, you wouldn't get to the real stuff in the sermon. But it's worth a little Google search or, re or you know, whatever you use, Yahoo, you know, uh, on Unitarianism. I will tell you this, that in the early 18th century, there was a debate on whether or not God was simply one or he was three entities equal in status and one. So the Unitarians believe God was simply one and the Trinitarians believe God was three persons but functioned as one. And this was the debate in the church at this time. God, whatever it is, bless you. It didn't quite sound like a sneeze so I, I wasn't quite sure how to address that. I think it was a Unitarian, whatever. <laughs> so there's this conflict in the church on whether or not, you know, God is three persons in one or whether he's just simply one. However, in the midst of this debate, it's interesting. Both doctrinal positions believed without question that the Bible was divinely inspired and the final authority for life, faith, and the practice thereof. Although there was a doctrinal disagreement, or I should say a theological disagreement, there was not a disagreement in whether or not the Bible was God's word and our final authority for life, faith, and the practice thereof. That was never in question. How we interpreted scripture was what was in question. Now, this hymn first appears in a hymnal entitled... Selection of hymns and poetry for use of infant and juvenile schools and families. So I was picturing this in a classroom. Can't you picture this in a classroom? You know, the teacher says, okay, kids, take out your books. And Johnny says, this is Jones, what book? Oh, take out selection of hymns and poetry for use of infant and juvenile schools and families. Rather lengthy title, but I must tell you, worthy of any school library. So today, we look at making practical the word of God in raising children and applying those, finish it, same principles to our lives as adults. Because if indeed the principles that we would like to see in the lives of our children, we live as adults, then not only is that something that is mouthed, but it's something that is caught. And ultimately, we live what we learn, and what we live is what is caught by our mentors. Mom, dad, school teacher, pastor, whomever it might be. So let's pray. Father, today as we look at your word, we rejoice with Josh and Lisa on this very special day in their lives when the incarnation of their love was presented to you. We look at the task that lies in front of them. I remember a conversation with Josh when he said, you know, I, 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 I really don't. I've never been a parent. It's a little frightening. But we thank you, Lord, that you are ultimately our dad. And uh, you have clearly given us instructions 
and those instructions do not fail. Because though the heavens and the earth may crumble to dust, and this um, society in which we live is ever-changing, your word is fixed. It's a rock upon which we can stand. And the church said, Amen. Amen. In the last service, I, um, on occasion I would say, and as they say in Montana, and someone with Irish descent said, you know, Pastor, when are you going to say, as they say in Ireland? Brilliant. Yes, thank you. Who got that? So, all right, Eugene, you remember, and you're Philippine. How do you, yeah, how do you, it's Ireland, you know? Okay. So turn with me to Joshua 24, verse 15. Here's where we find our text. Joshua is the sixth book in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua has the distinction of taking the Israelites into the promised land. Now, Moses was unable to do that. And we look at that moment in his life and we say, well, he was unable to go into the promised land because um, he profaned the word of God. And that's true. But the reason he profaned the word of God was because he represented the law. And what does the law do? You remember last week? It judges us. In a sense without a remedy. What does grace do? It pardons us and cleanses our conscience. So understand, if Moses wanted to, he couldn't have taken the Israelites into the promised land because the law doesn't take us to Canaan. It is grace that takes us to Canaan. And the church said, so Joshua has crossed over. The Israelites are with him. And he realizes they brought all this filth and wickedness and idolatry with them into the promised land. So he issues them a challenge. He says, listen, put away your foreign gods. That's what's messed us up anyway. You've worshipped these things. You've practiced, you know, your, their rituals. And it's, it's, it's caused God's curse upon us rather than his favor. So put them away. And when he does that, he says, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Some of the older translations say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The newer translations use household, which actually is a more accurate translation. Because, listen, it's not bricks and mortars that serve God, right? It, it is those who live inside of the home. So he says, for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And someone has profoundly said this. Read it with me. The beauty of a home is order. The blessing of the home is contentment. The glory of the home is hospitality. And the crown of the home is godliness. Think about that for a moment. If we were to name one person who embodied order, contentment, hospitality, and godliness... Who comes to your mind? Pastor Bruce. <laughs> no. <laughs> and if you looked in the mirror and you said, oh, look, Justin. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm picking on you, aren't I? We would have to say no. But who does? Come on. It starts with a J and ends with an S. Jesus. Spell his name. J E S U. He's the embodiment of these qualities that we would love to see in our lives, in our homes. So how do we as adults mirror Christ in our homes? And what are the lessons taught to our children when we do? Read that question with me. How do we as adults... Okay, I'm going to keep it simple. I'll give you an A and a B. A, children live what they learn. That's the message in Cats in a Cradle. Poignantly drives it home. And I'd like us to start where the home begins. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. You're in the New Testament now. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and you're there, all right? Galatians, Ephesians. It's page 1337. Actually, it's 1333. In your uh, prayer ministries edition and 1984 in your life application Bible. So here's what we read. Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. As Christ submitted to the Father, became our chief servant. He said, I didn't come to serve. Or I should say be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. He is our model as we model him, it expresses the reverence, the holiness of God. And here's where it starts. So ladies, read this to me. Oh, sounds like an orchestra out of tune. Let's, let's, let's get together, ready? Wives. No, 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 right there, that's enough. That is so beautiful. Can we hear it again? Yeah. Ladies, one more time, come on. Wives. Do you know what that verse means? Yeah. It means when your husband walks through the door, you go, oh, I mean, that's what it means. It's an absolute beautiful verse, I love it. Now, now, wait a minute, we're not over. We're just getting started. Okay, men, your turn. No, actually, let the ladies read verse 23. I, I, I think they would do a good job at it. Okay, ladies, for a husband... As... A man is the head of his home, so Christ is the head of the church. So dads, ladies, you can tune me out. Go ahead. You can talk, just I don't want to hear you. <laughs> Listen to what that's saying. Don't entrust godly things in the home purely to the wife. Because if we do, if it's the wife who takes care of family order, if it's the wife who sees that the children give the tithe, if it's the wife that sees that kids are in Sunday school or kids go to youth group or whatever, we as men have just said to our children that God, godly things, church, and the things of God are for the female gender and anything other than that is sissy. And that's why God clearly states, as Christ is the head of the church, men, we are the head of the home, which means we should assume the priesthood of the house. And the ladies said, Amen. and the men said, Amen. you betcha. So husbands, let's keep reading. Men, this is our part. Come on, husbands. Continuing to read, verse 31, as the scriptures say. Now, you see, you can't just read that first part. Now, you know, you hear preachers preach on that, and especially if they're what we call male chauvinists, which your pastor is not. But anyway, thank you for no amens. Actually, I should have had a bunch of amens. Okay, look at this. The, the foundation stone is wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church in this context. Christ was the chief servant to the church, so men are the chief servant of their homes. Now, in that light, look at what we read. As the scripture says, this is why a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one. Now... The newer translations use the word unite. It doesn't begin to graphically demonstrate what scripture means when it says cleave. This is the definition of cleave. It's when crazy glue gets between your thumb and your, in and your 
first finger. Which one, what's that called? Index, thank you. That's right, the other one we don't, no, never mind. The other one is what you get when somebody's mad at you when they're driving their car, and we won't even go there. But why are you woeing me? It's the truth. It's an absolute truth. So we're, you know what it is? It's you, what happens when your index finger meets your thumb with crazy glue. You can't get it apart unless you pry it apart. And when you pry it apart, what happens? Part of the flesh rips off. And so he's saying, that's how we should unite. We should be like this as husband and wife. Now look at this. There is a deep secret truth revealed in Scripture. Which I understand is applying to Christ and the church. But it also, come on, applies to you. That every husband must love his wife as himself. Have you ever met a man who didn't like himself? Maybe he didn't like himself, but he sure loved himself. I mean, I, every man I know, man, that's just our ego. We love who we are. We thank God we don't have to give birth to babies. You know what I mean? It was the funniest thing. I'm watching that video last night. I'm thinking about the time I was in Israel, and there's a Muslim sect called the Druze, and they have a third leg in their pants. Seriously. Like they're walking in front of you, and here's this pant leg, and there's pant leg, and then there's one hanging out here in the back. It's the strangest looking thing. It's kind of like moves, looks like a sack, because they believe that the Messiah will come through a male. And there's no, like, um, there, there's not that nine-month period of development to child. It's just the Messiah comes, drops out, it's right there. And I was looking at that movie, and I'm thinking, thank God... Ladies, that's your task and not mine. Husbands must love their wives, and every wife must respect her husband. Now, this is the JBSV version. I mean, JBSV, Joseph Bruce Sophia version. And I believe it's nailed, and so I want you to read it with me. Look, this is what it says. Wives and husbands... Love your wives with a moral, social obligation, just as Christ loved fallen man. I am convinced, and I've been in this for 30 plus years, I have never seen a marriage lost where the wife held her husband in awe. And I have never seen a marriage lost where the husband loved his wife as Christ loved the church. That word love is not sexual. That lo word love is not acquaintance. That word love is just as God created us in his very own image. And therefore, we are who he is. When we lost it because we were made in his image, he was not going to allow us to be estranged. And he said... I have a social, moral obligation to those who are made in my image to see that they do not remain divorced or estranged from me. And whether he felt like it, and I'm not so sure he felt like it. I think it's love that compelled him to go to a cross and die for us. Because, you know, when we get to the flood, he says, I'm sorry I ever made man. And there are times when you look at people around you and you say, yeah, God, I'm sorry you ever made him too. You know exactly what I'm saying. So, but he had a social moral obligation. And so men, that's how we're to love our wives. You know, you love your wives whether she was 90 pounds when you married her and now she um, isn't 90 pounds. You following me? I'm saying we are obligated. Isn't it strange? You know, a guy can be 167 pounds when he marries and 10 years later he's 267. You just feel good about yourself. It's that guys, you know, not loving themselves. I don't care what they look like. They love themselves, you know. Well, you ladies have a, a, you know, pressure on you from the world that tells you you have to look a certain way. And... Let's move on. I'll get myself in trouble. The hymn, happy the home when God is there and love fills every breast. When one their wish and one their prayer, 
and won their heavenly rest. Happy the home where Jesus' name is sweet to every ear, where children early speak his fame and parents hold him dear. So first point, children live what they learn. Second point, prioritize God. Can you say that with me? Prioritize God. Now, in this prioritize God, I'm going to give you five ways to do that. And I've got 14 minutes, and I'm actually going to be able to give you all five. Here's the first. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at verse 31. You've been sitting for a little while, so let's stay in. Matthew chapter 6, 31. And let's read it together, shall we? Do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? It really, isn't that what we always worry about? You know, like you take your wife out to, to, uh, to eat on a Friday night, and yeah, what do we want to eat? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what should I wear? Do you think this looks good? And then she says to us, what in the hang is that? Do you think that matches? Why are you wearing sneaks with dress pants and a dress shirt? Yeah. Uncomfortable. Don't worry about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. For the heathen run after all these things. And we are not heathen. We are, starts with an S, ends with an S, saints. Can I spell it for you? S-A-I-N-T-S. We are not heathen. We are saints. It's still weak. We are not heathen. We are saints. All right. Get that in your head. When you, when you think it, you live it. Amen. And the church said, amen. amen. Okay. In Ireland, they said, brilliant. And it is brilliant. All right. For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But do what? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, what you need to wear, what you need to eat. What you need to drink, he'll provide for you. It's so easy. So here are five ways to prioritize God in your life. You may be seated. The first is, say it with me, have a family order. Can I have you write down these five? Have a family order. Look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 19. Teach them, that is God's laws and precepts, to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. You know what God is saying? The word of God needs to permeate your home. Listen, when you wake up in the morning, talk about me. If you gather together at lunch, talk about me. If you're at the dinner table, talk about me. When you put the kids to bed, talk about me. Prioritize God. Let me be a part of just not one hour on Sunday morning or Sunday school or youth group. I need to be a part of your entire household every day. I was so privileged as a child to watch my parents have a family order. We did. My dad worked two shifts. He worked the first shift and the second shift. He was a uh, machinist, foreman at Owens, Illinois, in Glasper, closure division. And whenever my, we always had family order, whether dad was there or not. But when dad was there, that means first shift, he'd be home by 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And he would make sure we had family order. What did that mean? That means we prayed as a family, took prayer requests, read from God's word. And it was the funniest thing. All of my friends knew that. And they never came during that five to six o'clock hour. They, they just didn't come unless they were in trouble. It's amazing. One of my friends, Johnny Hutton, right? He's driving on a permit. No licensed driver in the car. And he's speeding because he wanted to see how fast the car could go. And he gets nailed. Where's the first place he goes? He doesn't even go home first. He's scared to death to go home. No, you know, oh, Sophia's, they have a prayer time like between 5 and 6 o'clock. I think I'm going to go over there because I need prayer before I get home. And it was interesting because my friends would always come over 
at our family altar time when they were in trouble. But that's not a bad thing. Because they realized that this was a family who prayed together. And we did the same thing in our household. You know, I, I put in a 15 to 16 hour day every day. I think I still do. <laughs> but I always, there were a few exceptions. But I always made it a point to be home for dinner. And Joel, Noel, Cheryl, and I, we would take prayer requests. We'd have the kids, when they were old enough, read a Bible story. And so together, we made the Word of God first in our lives. It was priority, a family order. And as I said to you, these disciplines are caught. They're not just mouth, they're caught. And as they're watched... They're learned, and as they're learned, they're live at, lived out. And so my parents consistently had a family order, and we consistently had a family order. And I'd like to encourage you, starting with the men, because you're the priest of your home, to see that your family has a family order. It doesn't have to be long. 10, 15 minutes. A verse, prayer request, praying together. Today's hymn says this. Just listen to it, and then you can join Pastor Brent as he leads it to you again. Happy the home where prayer is heard And praise each day doth rise Where parents love the sacred word And all its will Let's sing it, shall we? And happy the home where prayer is heard And praise each day doth rise Where parents love the sacred word And all its wisdom pride Some of the newer hymnals change that last word and say where it's wisdom share but the reality is God's word is wisdom it is the embodiment of life knowing what to do when to do it how to do it it's something we should prize and we prize it enough it's worthy of sharing look at it go with me to Psalm 119 you're in Deuteronomy, just move to the book of Psalms. And let's look at 119. It's a great psalm. Many of the um, verses we memorize are found in this psalm. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto my path. Many other verses are found in this psalm. But this is what we read. Read it with me. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. Listen, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Everything he has created serves him. So the other day, um, it was after church, and some of our teens were in the back, and they're arguing over whether or not God created evil. And they had come across the group who, whose theology is God created evil. And um, they were discussing that. And I said, there's no way God created evil. There's, there's no way that the one who is in essence, holy, pure, loving, just, would ever create evil. If you remember at creation, God looks at the whole thing and he says, what? It is very good. He doesn't say it's good, but it's good. Here's the exception. You see that snake, that slew foot? I created him too. No, he didn't. When he created Satan, he wasn't Satan. He was Lucifer. He was the model of perfection. But in his perfection, his pride reached the place where he thought he had the right to the worship 
that was entitled to God. He was so perfect, he thought, why not me? So in a moment, you, you know people like that, I know people like that. In a moment's time, their pride takes them right over the cliff. Instantaneous. And evil entered the world. Now, because God is omnipotent and God is sovereign, guess what? That evil serves him. Because everything serves God. Now, does he give you a free will? Absolutely. But there's coming a day when the overriding, omnipotent, sovereign will of God is going to make every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of lords and King of kings and no one will stand against him. No one. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me... This is awesome. Look at this. I love this. I never saw this until I studied this. And what's it do? Makes us wiser than our enemies. Now, we all understand that. But I never realized that the enemy of enemies... What's his name? Satan. So if indeed we'll not only immerse ourselves in the word of God, but live and obey the word of God, it makes us wiser than Satan himself. Slewfoot can't trip you up, that stinking snake. Just jump on his head and tell him you have no place. Guess what? The precepts of God make me wiser than you. And see, though God can foresee the future, Satan can't. He doesn't have that ability. So if you tap into God, God can tell you what's happening tomorrow and Satan doesn't know. What's that mean? You whip his tail. <laughs> that little red thing that hangs on the back of the New Jersey Devils, you whip it. All right, number two, quickly. I've got two minutes. We got, can I give you uh, two, three, four, five? Here we go in two minutes. Are you there? All right. See that your children have a quiet time every day. Not only you, but your kids. Not only your kids, but you. This is what we used to do with Joel and Noel. They weren't allowed to turn the television on until they had read a Bible story or watched Superbook. So I would come down or I'd be somewhere and I'd come in the house and I'd see the TV on and I'd say to Joel, Joel, Noel, did you um, watch Superbook yet today? Did you read your Bible story? Turn it off. Now, did they like that? No, they didn't. Certainly they didn't like that. But you know what? None of us like, come on, let's be honest, none of us like discipline. And these are disciplines. But in the end, disciplines are beneficial and profitable. And the church said, Amen. as they say in Ireland, brilliance. Absolutely. We taught them to give the first penny on every dime, the first dime on every dollar. The first $10 on every 100 Of course, they never had an allowance of $100. But the point was, put God first and watch how the day is blessed by God. But as parents, we have to live it and we have to teach it. Look at this, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits, the first fruits of your time, first fruits of your talent, first fruits of your treasure. And watch what happens. Then, it's conditional. Then, come on, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats so... Did I hear another? All right, number three. Make sure church isn't an option. Make sure church is not an option. You say, oh, pastor, you know, my 10-year-old doesn't want to come to church. So what? Don't give him a choice. I'm serious. You know what it is? It's like, listen, it's breakfast. So you have here at the table a, a slice of multi-grain toast with cream cheese. And you have a glazed donut. What are they going to pick? Come on. The glazed donut. They're not picking cream cheese, multi-grain toast. Come on. Listen, you don't give your kids an option on whether or not they go to school, do you? And I'm telling you, church is more important than school. You can say all you want, but it is more important than school. The most important thing you can do to or with or place in your child's life is that God is first, the things of God are next, 
And if he's absent, you're missing the greatest aspects, the greatest joys of life, period. And you set them on a course that will never set them wrong, ever, ever. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, don't have time, just jot it down. Number four, be consistent in discipline. Can you say that with me? Be consistent in discipline. Look at it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. He who... Ah, but you don't hear it that way. What do you hear? He who spares the rod spoils the child. That's not what God says. God says you spare the rod, you hate your son. Notice that the daughters are exempt. But he who loves him is careful to discipline him. It's funny. Noel, you didn't, you didn't have to worry. All you had to do was tell her she was getting the paddle. Dad, I'll never do it again. Honest. I'll never, never, I'll never do it again. I said, you're right. You will never do it again. Smack, smack. Joel just stared at me and said, bring it on. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction drives it far from him. Every child is full with foolishness. Why? What is foolishness? It's when our life is all about us. That's foolishness, and that's what a child is. Their whole life is them. There's not another thing that exists besides them. That's a child, but we grow up, hopefully. You ever meet a 60-year-old child? I mean, it's pretty pathetic, isn't it? Like, aren't you ever going to grow up, Joe? Come on. Get with it. Hey, I remember the first time I ever got a spanking. Now, it probably wasn't the first time. It was the first time I remember. I was in church. And I was misbehaving. Can you believe your pastor would misbehave in church? I'm pretty sure it was a Sunday night. And my dad said to me, Bruce... I'm going to take you out if you don't behave. And I'm thinking, he's not taking me out of church. I got, I'm over on him, baby. You ain't taking me out. That's going to embarrass you. Haul your kid. We were on like the third row. Out of church and spank me. You're not doing that. In my mind. I'm only five or six, you know. But you're amazing what your little five and six-year-old minds can think. And you, would you believe he hauled me out of church? I'll never, never forget it. We were at, at my, my grandma passed at a church where the old bus station is in Turnersville. And, you know, it was 65 people. I thought it was, was uh, look at it now, 65, that's small. But, you know, that was probably a, f a pretty large percentage of the population of Turnersville at the time. But anyway, so he took me out. And we, we had for railings those two and a half inch, like, what were they, iron or, or steel pipes that you would paint gray. And he put me over that pipe. And he applied the Board of Education to the seat of learning. And I have to tell you, I never misbehaved again in church. Never. Now, my sister, the blockhead that she is, that's a different story, you know, but not me. <laughs> Let's close with this. What time is it? Oh, look, it's not even 1230. Goodness, I've got at least eight minutes. Let's go. No, no, we'll close with this. By the way, I, I really should say this. The Bible does tell us to use the rod. And there's a reason, because the rod's an inanimate object. You should never hit your kids with your hands. That's expression of affection and love. You should not confuse them that, just like with a dog. Hit your hand with your, you smack your dog one time with your hand, and I want to tell you, that dog will jump every time you go to touch it. There's a reason why God says to use an inanimate object, a rod. But there's a right and a wrong way to use a rod. And I don't have time to to go into it, but I'd encourage you to pick up my CD that says how to make your children mind without losing yours. And it's in the bookstore. It's worth picking up. How to discipline our children biblically. But the last is this. Praise and encourage. Proverbs 12, 18. Can you read it with me? Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Graceful words build people up. Graceless words tear people down. As Christians, we are called to graceful words. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome, I'm going to read it with me. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In too many cases, a child's value, especially the daughter's, is directly attributed to the praise or the lack thereof of their father. You can speak to any of our pastors, starting with John Smythe and our children's pastor, moving to Matt as our youth, Josh as our young adults, move to Ron Ravely and our senior adults. And I'm going to tell you, girls' opinion of themselves is directly relational to their dad. Their praise, their words of encouragement, directly relational to their fathers. My mom and my dad taught Sandy and I that we could do anything we put our minds to. Anything. We never questioned it. I was five foot eight playing on a Washington Township basketball team and I thought I could play center because I loved that position. Bill Russell was my idol. Wilt Chamberlain was my enemy. You, those of you who understand 76 or ball and Boston ball understand that. And then I thought about that. Because I got to the place where I realized at five foot eight, I wasn't playing center for anybody. And I thought, yes, I could have. Maybe I couldn't have physically played that position. But if I believed God that was my calling, my parents said to me, then become a coach. And coach the best center in the league. And you will indeed play center. That's the kind of praise and encouragement we should, as moms and dads, place in our children every day. There's not a thing with God's help that you cannot accomplish. And the church said. So let's stand and sing this last verse, shall we? Happy, oh Lord, sorry. Lord, let us see our homes agree. This blessed peace to gain. Unite our hearts in love to thee and love to Hey, let's in some way connect. If you feel comfortable taking a hand, you can do that. If you'd just rather place a hand on a shoulder. But in one way or another, let's, let's make sure we just connect together, shall we? Balcony, bottom floor, if you want to connect across the aisles, we can do that. Come on, let's do that. Let's connect in the aisle which means you're not going to be able to connect behind you, but they can put their shoulder on you in the aisle. Come on. You and Eliane. That's it. Wonderful. So as a family, let's commit to being that kind of a model that we can trust what has been taught we want learned. Now, I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, but pastor, it's too late. It's just too late. I haven't spoken to my son for 25 years. I don't even have a relationship with my daughter. It is never, never, never too late. We see people just a day before passing from life to the next make it right with God. We see people over and over again in this congregation haven't had relationships with moms or dads or uncles or aunts. Make it right. It's never, ever too late. If God has put breath in your body, yesterday ended last night, today is a new day. So let's sing this verse together as a fact. Lord, let us sing our home. 
what we learn so let's prioritize God you say pastor where do I begin with a relationship with him how can you model who you don't possess we bow our heads close our eyes those of you who have yet to enter into a relationship with Jesus right where you stand say father in heaven thank you for loving me Forgive me for the things I've done that are wrong. I am sorry. And I confess to you that I am a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Give me the strength to model who you are. My life is yours.